everybody. Nice to see some familiar faces. Now. Madam President, good to see you. It's so great to see you. Likewise. Miss you Come guys. back to the UN already. Where have you been? We miss you. <laughs> <laughs> when I stayed in New York for a while, but now I'm escaping from the cold and I'm, I'm at home in, in Quito. Smart move. Smart move. Good to yeah. see you. <laughs> Likewise. So good to see everybody and to see, have been seeing Javika quite a bit these days. It feels <laughs> very good. The advantages of technology. Yeah. From across the world. Okay, we can start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those joining us from around the world and a warm welcome to the CSW 65 virtual and interactive side event that seeks to generate excitement and momentum for the Generation Equality Forum taking place from March 29th to the 31st in Mexico City, literally around the corner and again in June in Paris, France. My name is Sherwin Bryce Bees. I'm a journalist and a United Nations correspondent for the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC News. Welcome. This is an opportunity for a cross-section of people from youth representatives, activists and thought leaders to civil society, the United Nations and other international organizations, the private sector and our representatives in governments around the world to get involved, a truly multi-stakeholder global gathering that is turning the very definition of what multilateralism looks like on its head and what it can mean moving forward. As someone said to me the other day, this is a process driven by people and not by member states. And that's really a refreshing approach, is it not? From the bottom up. Look, we love our member states. Let's not get it twisted. But they do sometimes need a kick up the you know what, and we're all here to help with that. The Generation Equality Forum was conceived to mark the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and to re-energize the slowing momentum we have all witnessed in terms of its full implementation. The forum, therefore, is seen as a major inflection point for Goal 5 of the Sustainable Development Goals that seeks to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls before 2030. How? by creating a shared roadmap for progress and reinvigorating efforts to tackle the unfinished business around gender equity. Remember, before anyone could say coronavirus with the fluency we have all since become accustomed to, the equality agenda was lagging. Progress was uneven, sluggish, and the targets set in goal five were simply not being met. The pushback we experienced, the reversals we were seeing, the unfathomable violence directed at women and girls, existed even before COVID-19 became a clear and present danger to that demographic. It literally poured gasoline on the raging fire. And what this forum is about is extinguishing that fire with as many foot soldiers or firefighters we can muster. This is an all hands on deck affair. We all have, all of humanity, a stake in the success of this movement. The forum also aims to launch five-year multi-stakeholder-led action coalitions and a compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action to catalyze action, drive investment and deliver concrete game-changing results. That's the point. So a few housekeeping announcements. We have Spanish and French interpretation so that we can feel the energy of Mexico City and Paris in our bones. Uh, in addition to Arabic and sign language interpretation and closed captioning. You can also participate in the conversation through the Q&A button on the virtual platform. And let me encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag act for equal to help us create a groundswell of awareness and action in the run up to the Gender Equality Forum. I'll remind you again near the end of our program. Given the high levels of subscription, I'm told close to 2,000 people have registered for today's event. We've created an overflow room on the UN Women's uh, YouTube page. So if you cannot get onto the Zoom platform, fear not, go to YouTube, to UN Women's page to follow the live event there. 
We've broken up the next 90 minutes or so into three segments. A bit later, we'll introduce you to Julieta Martinez, who will moderate our second segment. But for now, I'm pleased to hand over to gender equality and human rights activist, Pip Gardner. Pip will introduce themselves further. Pip, you have the reins. Thank you, Sherwin. Hi, my name is Pip Gardner. Um, my pronouns in English are they, them, and I'm a member of the Generation Equality Youth Task Force. I'm based in the UK, where I'm the chief exec of the Kite Trust, and I also work with the International Falcon Movement Socialist Education International. As youth has been uh, prioritised and aimed to be put in the lead in the generation equality process, this first segment, we're going to focus on youth activism, leadership and action and have a discussion about meaningful youth participation. In this section, I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Audrey Fontaine from France, who is a youth advocate and member of Generation Equality Youth Task Force as well. And we're also going to uh, meet a panel of speakers who are going to respond to a short discussion. Katiti Sylvain Obidi, who is the CEO of Enable the Disabled Action, a uh, gender and national youth activist and a member of the Generation Equality Youth Task Force. Javika Shiv from Bangladesh, who is a gender equality practitioner, lawyer and associate director at the Fair Trial Programme and a national gender youth activist in India. And Carla Acosta, um, who is a high level advocacy chair of the Youth Coalition for Sexual uh, and Se Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights and part of the Action Coalition leadership. So firstly, I'd like to pass over to my colleague Audrey Fontaine, who is going to um, introduce uh, the Young Feminist Manifesto. Um, thank you very much, Pip. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Pip, for this uh, introduction. Thank you as the organizers for uh, this amazing event today and the ones to come. Um, so as Pip said, I am Audrey, I'm based in France and I'm part of the Generation Equality Youth Task Force. So I had the chance to work with 39 other amazing and inspiring youth activists to facilitate youth leadership and participation in the upcoming Generation Equality Forum. So the Generation Equality Forum is an historical high level event on gender. As we can see in today's event, um, the forum is an amazing opportunity for intergenerational and intersectional work and policy transformation, which includes all stakeholders. We've learned a lot from each other during this process and we continue to learn, but there is always room for improvement. And that's why building on our experiences and on this experience, uh, the youth community involved in all the steps of the Generation Equality Forum processes has come together to emit some recommendations and to share some best practices to further reshape youth engagement. So I will share with you a few of the main uh, recommendations. We first encourage for conducting power analysis in all governance and decision-making structures to identify the main weaknesses and then to take the appropriate measures and ensure equal distribution of power. We also recommend to set agendas and goals commonly in order to ensure that all stakeholders can participate at the same level of engagement and to use commonly agreed methodology that would foster co-creation. It is also important to be transparent and clear on the role of everyone around the table and in the decision-making procedures. To do so, we are convinced that the creation of space for open conversation where all representatives can build meaningful relationship and trust is crucial. We also encourage for capacity threatening, not only for youth, but for all partners and actors. We would like to emphasize for uh, safeguarding mechanisms that would prevent burnout and tokenism. Young feminists can be exposed to matters that would threaten their mental health and well-being, and we need to do everything possible to prevent this from happening. And finally, it is essential to give recognition and compensation to youth activists to recognize our time, expertise, and overall contributions. So this is a brief overview of our recommendation, but you're gonna have a more comprehensive document that will go public next week. So keep an eye on it. And I would just like to conclude by saying that transformative co-leadership is a goal that can be achieved if we all work together. And we see the upcoming Mexico and France forums as historical moments in this regard. And I would like to thank all the people who are dedicating time and energy to allow these events to happen. And also to all youth activists who are moving mountains and who make our generation, generation equality. Thank you. 
Thank you, Audrey. And yes, um, I see several comments in the, the chat function on the platform of where to find the document. So I would suggest people to people who would like to see it, um, it's going to be launched next week. So the best thing to do would be follow the Generation Equality Youth Task Force social media channels, which is at Beijing 25 Youth on Twitter. I now want to invite our members of our panel um, to join the screen and um, several of them will be speaking in uh, different languages so if you have not yet switched your interpretation function on even if uh, so far English has been okay uh, you need to turn on the English interpretation to be able to follow the speeches that some of the panelists will be making. So our question um, that I'm going to put to our three panelists is what does meaningful youth participation look like in your context from an intersectional perspective? And how do we apply that to the Generation Equality Forum and processes that go beyond that? First off, I would like to invite Sylvain to respond to that question. Merci, <clears throat> merci beaucoup, Pip, pour um, cette question. Uh, comme il a dit, je suis Sylvain et je suis de la RDC. Je fais partie des groupes de travail des de jeunes de Beijing. Et comment est-ce que les jeunes peuvent être inclus dans les processus de, de Beijing? En fait, les jeunes euh, ont des mécanismes de participation et, et ces mécanismes, il y a des jeunes qui sont réunis autour des Youth Task Force, des jeunes qui sont des jeunes activistes pour l'égalité des sexes. Il y a des jeunes qui sont réunis autour des coalitions d'action et les autres jeunes qui sont dans des organisations pour que ces jeunes puissent continuer à faire avancer l'agenda de Beijing. Il est très important que leurs avis soient pris en considération quand ils peuvent avoir des, des situations à soulever. Euh, comme euh, je peux le dire, l'activisme des jeunes est très essentiel pour bâtir des sociétés pacifiques, et justes et inclusives. Et dans différentes régions du monde, les jeunes mènent des actions innovantes qui contribuent essentiellement à faire avancer, les, 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 à faire, à faire avancer la bonne gouvernance. Et malgré leur contribution, ils, ils continuent à faire face à des, à des importantes difficultés qui sont très souvent manque de bonnes politiques, euh, il y a aussi des contraintes financières, les sous-appréciations et, et d'autres injustices économiques. Et le pouvoir des jeunes et leurs énergies est très important pour surmonter les, les obstacles et assurer une, une, une direction vers le développement durable et ne peuvent être négligés. Donc, euh, les jeunes sont aussi et fait partie de ces processus pour que nous puissions atteindre les, les résultats. Merci beaucoup, Sylvain. Thank you very much. I'd now like to turn to Javika and apologize for um, the error I made in her introduction. She is a national gender youth activist from India. Over to you. Thank you, Pip, and good morning, good evening um, to everybody around. Um, thank you. I think it's a very important question about what gender equality and within that meaningful engagement of youth means. Um, coming from India, where there's so much diversity, we are all from different regions, religions, um, you know, castes, uh, and of course, the overarching idea of poverty. How do we look at it? We need to be able to hear grassroots voices. And I think that's what the manifesto also speaks about, grounding and allowing the space at the table for grassroots voices. And I think as a national youth gender activist, that's been our domain to be able to bring in the local voices, to be able to get them a seat at the table. And I think it's very important to hear us at the table as youth today across countries. And I think that's been a big learning in the last three, four months of engaging with the gender equality principles. And I think very importantly, as a feminist and as one who's come from an understanding in rural India, um, collective action for change is extremely important. But that can't happen with the seat at the agenda table. And to be able to look at how we co-create and co-lead, um, that's something that we also posit about in the manifesto as we see that, you know, transformation leadership. It's not enough to just participate. 
you know we've been participating as lopa said yesterday at an intergenerational dialogue for years uh, how do we actually make it meaningful is when we start co-leading it and that shakes par that shakes um, you know the existing systems and i think all stakeholders in the system have to accept that while you learn from mentors and you know we've learned from so many in the feminist movement we also build our futures and i think you know to build our futures we build it in a new way and that's the space that we are asking for um especially looking at you know issues that come from the ground and as a young person in india i can't emphasize that enough to say that we need to build and keep building dialogue and discussion as a core of this thank you very much and now um to also um add to this conversation our third panelist carlos is going to speak to the same um uh, topic of youth participation well thank you so much um Good morning, everyone. Buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, mi nombre es Carlos Acosta y soy un médico de Colombia. Eh, estoy muy contento de participar aquí y soy uno de los eh, líderes de ONU Mujeres eh, en, en las coaliciones de acción. Entonces, eh, bueno, para mí la equidad generacional eh, significa no solo reconocer nuestro conocimiento y nuestro valor como gente joven dentro del espacio eh, de toma de decisiones, es muy importante también eh, reconocer que también tenemos diferentes tipos de conocimiento y diferentes tipos de, de, eh, de, de carga que tenemos en la espalda, de experiencias, y que eso también es válido. Es válido en la mesa, es válido para todos quienes se sientan con nosotros. Y tenemos que reconocer que eso tiene valor. ¿sí? Nosotros venimos como gente joven a aportar a que nuestros proyectos y nuestras actitudes sean eh, de construcción positiva para el movimiento feminista y eso es lo que nosotros representamos. Lo que nosotros traemos a la mesa tiene un valor, tiene algo que va a servir al movimiento en el presente y en el futuro. Eh, entonces quiero referirme específicamente al, al manifesto de juventudes del cual hemos estado construyendo, que hemos enfocado nuestro eh, manifesto a encontrar un balance de poderes dentro de la mesa. Cuando nosotros estamos discutiendo con personas con más recursos, con personas del de hemisferio norte del mundo, con personas de, eh, eh, cosmopolitas y venimos con nuestra carga de personas rurales, de personas indígenas, esas voces tienen que, se ver, se, tienen que verse reflejadas en la mesa también. Y es momento de que como eh, comunidad joven valoremos nuestra propia voz y consigamos traer esa voz a la mesa al mismo nivel con el resto de las personas. No vamos a eh, aceptar más, eh, digamos, un cierto tipo de sabotaje eh, debido a que esto ya se ve reflejado, digamos, crónicamente dentro de muchos sistemas en el mundo y creemos que tenemos que dar una pausa disruptiva a este tipo de, eh, de, de situación para poder aportar de una manera significativa y poder llevar a que los proyectos sean eh, sean concebidos, sean eh, realizados. Eh, cuando yo como médico tengo en mi, en mi consultorio una, una niña, una joven que no puede preguntar sobre eh, su estado de salud, sobre cuáles son sus necesidades, es claro que tenemos una brecha intergeneracional, es claro que no tenemos aún todas las respuestas y, y, y todo lo que podemos hacer y traer esas personas a la mesa es clave para poder tener este tipo de, eh, de, de eh, resultado eh, de, eh, por parte de nuestros movimientos. Es, es un claro un síntoma de opresión que tenemos que discutir, que no puede ser extraño a nuestras discusiones eh, y esperamos que este tipo de, de eh, temáticas y también de esfuerzos lleguen a la mesa, lleguen a la mesa con el mismo poder con, con la cual diferentes organizaciones han venido aquí a las Naciones Unidas a uh, también eh, debatir con nosotros. Entonces, queremos que este movimiento sea inclusivo y eso es eh, equidad generacional. Muchas gracias. Many thanks for that contribution. And I think it's been great to hear from our panelists. And I think the reflection that this manifesto has grown out of the, the diversity of youth who have been engaged in the generation equality process so far. We have to engage youth of, of all genders, from all regions, from all languages, and to make that uh, as accessible and inclusive a process as possible so that we can achieve transformative change that really meaningfully engages with those in all of our communities. 
Next up, um, we're going to move to show a short video clip um, created by the Generation Equality Youth Task Force on the subject of what does generation equality mean to us? you um, and in the spirit of that video and um, in the spirit of the engagement that we've had um, as youth in the process so far and the conversations we want to open today to be a conversation to and invite the attendees to uh, also contribute their answers to that question there are going to be some instructions in the chat as to how you might be able to contribute a one or two word answer through uh, a menti interactive um, uh, poll uh, or display so that we can capture the sense uh, from all the people in the room. But whilst you have a few moments to, to add your thoughts on what does generation equality mean to you to that tool, I'm going to pass it back to our panelists for them to give us their, their answers. Sylvain, what does generation equality mean to you? Merci beaucoup, Pip. Je ne sais pas si je peux reprendre la parole. Yes, if you'd like to just answer the question very, very short of what does generation equality mean to you? Au fait, euh, merci beaucoup pour la question. Pour moi, génération égalité veut dire euh, justice sociale. Une justice qui n'est autre que cette possibilité qui est offerte à chaque homme, à chaque femme, euh, de, de pouvoir revendiquer euh, librement et avec les chances égales et sa juste participation aux richesses qu'il ou qu'elle a aidé à, à créer. Euh, donc, euh, ça, cela veut parce que l'augmentation des inégalités et l'exception représente une menace à la cohésion sociale et à la croissance économique et au progrès des humains. Thank you. We've got lots of interesting contributions coming in. I think I was struck by one of the early ones of actions, not words. And I think it's great that we've got justice there right at the heart of the, the contributions that are coming in. Javika, are there any of the words that are appearing on the screen um, that really strike and resonate with you? I think just the fact of intersectionality and change, to be able to change injustices and lead to a different change in power dynamic, I saw, are an opportunity. So we're, while we're also changing something, we're also looking at building opportunities, breaking social norms, and making it local to global uh, to, for, to participate and engage. I think that's what generation equality would mean to me right from India. Yeah. Thank you. And Carlos, are there any of the ideas that are appearing that resonate with your idea of what generation equality means? Claro que sí. Eh, para mí, definitivamente, dos de las palabras que resuenan son las de interseccionalidad, eh, justicia y cambio. Porque reconocemos que hoy tenemos que cambiar el movimiento feminista para poder incluir a todos dentro de la discusión. Y es importante que eh, a partir de esa inclusión generemos más oportunidades de participación significativa y que esa participación sea transformativa también. Entonces que sea un esfuerzo de co-crear 
esa eh, participación y esos eh, eh, resultados dentro del movimiento. Definitely. Thank you so much for our panelists and for everybody who has been also answering this question and contributing to this this great um, diagram that we're seeing appearing. I really hope that this will be a resource to bring the all of the attendees' voices into the room for all of the segments to follow. And with that note, I'm going to pass back to Sherwin and ask if anything strikes you from the words that we're seeing appear. Yeah, let's keep it up, Pip. Um, justice certainly uh, uh, at the centre, as you correctly point out, a central pillar really of, of how we move uh, this conversation forward. Change, intersectionality, I think that's very important. And it's so great uh, that this intergenerational discussion is led by our youth leaders. So kudos to them for leading on a very important discussion where they will have a central role. You know, when we talk about Goal 5 and the various targets that that encapsulates, uh, the youth, uh, youth leadership on that question is going to be very, very key. So it's nice. It's good to see them leading from the way, uh, from the front. And, and Pip, thanks so much for leading that very, very informative discussion. Inclusion, social justice, in, in, inclusivity, liberty, it's all there. We'll refer to the, uh, the, the Mentimeter a little later to, to share our audience thoughts with uh, the thousands that have joined us from around the world. If you've just joined us, you're late, but welcome to this uh, discussion as we build momentum towards the Generation Equality Forum. It's my great honor now to introduce you to our next moderator for segment two of today's virtual event. She is a climate and gender equity activist, and her name is Julieta Martinez. Julieta, you have the floor. Thank you so, so much. Hello, I hope everyone is doing amazing. I would like to start by saying thank you so much for having to give me the opportunity to moderate this second segment, this intergenerational dialogue, and of course, the curtain raiser to the Generation Equality Forum in Mexico City. As Sherwin said before, I'm Pilita Martinez. I'm a 17-year-old climate justice and gender equality activist from Chile. I'm the founder of a global platform called Tremendas. And right now, I'm a member of the Youth Task Force of the Beijing Platform for Action. Today, I have the pleasure to be with Marta Delgado, Undersecretary of Forging a First Mexico. Maria Fernanda Espinosa, member of the GWL Voices for Change and Inclusion and former president of the United Nations General Assembly. Nadine Gassman, president National Institute of Women from Mexico. Annie Sophie Noir, I hope I pronounced that right, Danish Youth Delegate for Equality and CRHR. Elvira Pablo, policy and member engagement officer for Latin America and the Caribbean Girls Not Brides. Brights, the Global Partnership to End Child Marriage from Mexico, Lina Bob Habib, Interim Director at Far Institute, American University of Beirut, Mohamed Ali Radawi, queer feminist activist and environmental justice advocate from Tunisia, a member of the UN Women National Gender Youth Advocates Network, and Jandi Banda, feminist activist and global location advocate from Zambia. Chairperson of Transport Education and International Youth Less Coalition hosted by UNESCO. These are amazing panelists, and I'm totally sure that it's going to be an amazing conversation. So, I would like to ask to each panelist two questions, which are What are the takeaways of your experience in the Generation Equality Forum inclusive multi stakeholder leadership and co creation? And what do you think that are the most innovative solutions that have evolved during the Generation Equality Forum preparatory process. I would like to ask to each panelist to use about for about two to three minutes to answer questions. And I would like to ask Marta to start, please. Hey, Julieta, I, um, vamos a comenzar por eh, la, 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 la ministra Nadine, por favor. Okay. So, so. I would like to, not, uh, to ask Nadine to answer the questions, please. Muy buenos días y realmente eh, a todas, a todos, a todes. Eh, es realmente una gran emoción estar ahí. Bonjour a tout le monde. On est très, très contente eh, d'être aujourd'hui ici. 
Two years ago, in the 63rd CSW, Mexico announced along France and New England that we were going to host the 2020 Global Forum to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference. With the full conviction that gender equality and empowerment of women in all the diversity are fundamental to have a fair, sustainable and, and peaceful societies. Then, as you are aware, the COVID pandemic came and the world stopped. First, we had to coordinate the response to the emergency, and then we had to adapt and plan uh, to face the new reality. This difficult situation highlighted how important what was adopted 25 years ago was, how pertinent the, the, the Beijing agenda is, and also how important it is to address gender equality if we want to achieve the 2030 agenda. In this context, the Generation Equality Forum, and need, as I said, something that has been uh, thought, done in all these difficult times with having youth and civil society and the feminist movement at the center is here. It will happen in Mexico City online, but we have a big surprise. You will feel like you're in Mexico City. You'll feel and you have the opportunity not just to be in spaces where you hear people, but to network, to go to booths, to, to really have an experience of being there. And then the conclusions will go to Paris at the end of June and beginning of July. The forum in Mexico will place women and girls' rights agenda in their forefront for centering their voices of grassroots organizations, indigenous, Afro-descendant, young women. It will be truly intersectoral. It will be co-created because it has been conceived as an accelerator of social change and accountability. It's a new way to join our voices and to go to action as, as it has been said yes here. The aim, the energy is to have a transformative actions, to go from words to actions, to act equal. So we welcome you to Mexico. We hope you are with us soon. Thank you so, so much, Nadine. As you said, this is a, an amazing space to get a, a, an accelerator of social change and of course, accountability. I will ask you, uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa next to answer the questions, please. Thank you so, so much, uh, Julieta. Uh, I'm so thrilled to see this uh, youth manifesto uh, taking shape. Uh, I have to say that as a, as a member of the, of the uh, uh, steering committee of, of the forum, uh, I have had the privilege to accompany the preparatory process of the Generation Equality Forum. And I would just only like to, to mention three features that I think make these, uh, the forum um, an innovation platform for multilateralism. Uh, the first one is inclusion. Uh, as uh, you very well mentioned, uh, the forum has brought different voices, different generations, different backgrounds, regions, ethnicities uh, that have participated uh, in the co-creation of a new action-oriented agenda for gender equality. I have witnessed the traction and the power, for example, of indigenous women, women with disabilities, women in science, leaders of feminist, the, the feminist movement, a, a young change makers uh, working at the national and the international level. It, I think it has been a profound democratic process you know, to overcome this disconnect that we often, uh, you know, um, are, are unhappy about, the disconnect between scales, actors, knowledge, policy, uh, and action. So uh, that's uh, the first feature. The second is the co-creation of an action-oriented agenda for the years to come. And this is going to happen through the six action coalitions that Sharon mentioned at the beginning, plus, 
a very innovative, forward-looking pact for women, peace and security. And of course, this co-creation has been deeply affected by the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis and it, its uh, impact on, on women and girls uh, uh, worldwide. And the third feature is the role of women in the establishment of a new social contract a new pact uh, to transform the relationship between the economy, environment, and politics. And, and, were, and of course, words have to come with funding, building forward better and uh, a feminist uh, green uh, world has to include investment in women's rights and gender equality. So we are in the making of a new ecological and feminist global pact the Generation Equality Forum is going to be the place to do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to close and get back to you, uh, Julieta, I, uh, I have felt so privileged uh, to be part of the steering committee and to take uh, you know, uh, a part of this uh, co-creation and of this innovation platform for a, a strong networked inclusive multilateralism for gender equality. So uh, thank you very much and back to you, Julieta. Thank you so, so, so much, Maria Fernanda. Now I would like to tell, um, now it's gonna, we're gonna show a video that it's about the Generation Equality Forum in Mexico. So we can start, we're gonna give a little pass to this conversation, see the video and get more information about it. El Foro Generación Igualdad está por arrancar desde la Ciudad de México. Se trata de un encuentro mundial para la igualdad de género. Es convocado por ONU Mujeres, copresidido por Francia y México, y cuenta con el liderazgo de la sociedad civil feminista, así como la participación de múltiples actores relevantes. El foro busca ponernos a las mujeres y niñas en toda nuestra diversidad al centro del desarrollo, garantizarnos el goce efectivo de nuestros derechos y avanzar hacia la igualdad plena. Esto es el Foro Generación Igualdad. El Foro Generación Igualdad está por arrancar desde la Ciudad de México. Se trata de un encuentro mundial. There you go. Now I will go back to uh, Marta Delgado. That's it's here right now. So hello, Marta. How are you? How are you doing today? Fine, thank you very much. And uh, this is a privilege for me being part of this uh, event. Thank you very much for inviting me. Of course, uh, may, uh, may I ask you, should I, I repeat the questions so you could answer them, right? No, I, I just want to, uh, to say that uh, this is uh, going to be a very relevant occasion for Mexico. I want to say hello to my dear Maria Fernanda Espinosa, and also Nadine Gasman, Elvira Pablo, Alina, uh, Mohamed Ali, uh, Radu Adi and Jande, and of course to you, uh, Julieta, for, for being here uh, in this discussion. Uh, I think that the most innovative solutions that we can share are going to be um, discussed in this 75 CSW and also about the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, mm -hmm. Mrs. Uh, Funsile Mambo has been very, very um, uh, has been a real leader around the world to, to join this effort and to lead all these uh, uh, coalitions that are gonna be launched in this uh, forum. One of the most innovative elements of the forum is gonna be the multi-stakeholder format that uh, even women has been also promoting around the world. The inclusion of different actors uh, in this process will, will enrich the dialogue, all the approaches and innovative solutions to accelerate uh, efforts to achieve gender equality. And uh, I think that this approach is needed more than ever right now to generate a real solutions and address great challenges. There is no sector of our society right now that by itself can design and implement successful actions, particularly civil society organizations, uh, grassroots women movements, and also the young people are going to be uh, the key actors for this forum. Women and girls are the most important 
impacted uh, by structural inequalities aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is a, junk, is, is a junctural um, uh, challenge, but is going to change a lot the way we are living in cities, we are living in houses, we are educating people, and we are spreading some uh, justice that the women and girls need around. So the, the participation will be active, and that I think that uh, is uh, the uh, innovation that we are going to work in in this uh, Generation Equality Forum that will start next, next uh, week. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you so, so much. And as I said before, I'm so excited to see youth as the keys of, of change, of for real changes, for real action. I'm really excited to see that International Equality Forum in Mexico City super soon. I will, I will continue asking Anne, Anne, if you could answer the questions. Yes, thank you so much. And I'll say youth is important as well, yeah. Um, we've come a long way uh, regarding gender equality. And I think that is evident when we look here across generations. And uh, I can only say that I applaud all activists uh, before me, truly. Um, as young women and future leaders, we need uh, female role models to look up to. Um, but we also need someone to mirror ourselves in at eye level. Um, therefore, I believe in the importance of a peer-to-peer uh, peer -peer approach in uh, global partnerships as well. Development projects driven by young people across countries and communities. Um, and I speak from years of uh, personal experience with girls' rights projects in Africa and South America, when I say that these types of projects really can make an impact. Um, so I would just say trust and invest in us uh, to change status quo and shape a more uh, equal tomorrow. Um, and then as an independent and privileged young woman, I can just promise to do my part because uh, we want to, we want more than policies that work for us. Uh, we want to actually work with you um, on this agenda because we have a common mission to ensure that we all have the freedom to fulfill our full potential. Um, regardless of gender. A world where no girl is forced out of school and into motherhood and life as a housewife. A world where all women are empowered with equal rights and representation. No less <laughs> and uh, much more, of course. Um, so therefore, whenever you talk about young women, uh, remember to actually include us and actively listen to us like today. Thank you. Um, because the minds of two generations just uh, think better than one. Um, and then I started out saying that we've come a long way. We've overcome setbacks in the past, and I'm sure we'll overcome this pandemic as well. Uh, we are not at the finish line yet for gender equality, and we've come too far to give in now. So I just look forward to continuing this mission across the globe and across generations. Um, and then let's make this march in Mexico the momentum. Thank you. Chloe, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And I will ask now to, to Elvira Pablo. Hello, Elvira. It's, uh, it's really nice to see you again, to, ask the, uh, to answer the two questions, please. Yeah, thank you, Julieta. Uh, I will speak in Spanish. Um, bueno, primero, para nosotras también eh, liderazgo y co-creación significa descentralizar, significa construir consensos, significa cuestionarnos y estar dispuestas también a transformar incluso nuestras propias prácticas. ¿no? Eh, justo las juventudes hemos traído a la mesa estas opiniones, estas ideas en las que también... Eh, Tratamos de que lo que sucede en lo global realmente se refleje en, en lo local y en nuestras comunidades, ¿no? Y creo que quisiera retomar lo que decía María Fernanda Espinosa, que decía que las palabras vayan acompañadas de fondos, solo agregar que las palabras vayan acompañadas de acciones, ¿no? Creo que eso es algo muy urgente, muy pertinente y que además, pues este es el momento, ¿no? Para hacer este llamado a, a la acción, ¿no? Y a la acción inmediata. Eh, sabemos que las niñas, las adolescentes, las mujeres, jóvenes... Eh, y especialmente que en mi caso que formo parte de un pueblo indígena, sabemos que enfrentamos grandes desigualdades estructurales que además por la pandemia bueno, se han profundizado aún más y esta es una oportunidad para reforzar estos avances, para 
comprometernos y para generar acciones multiactor, que esto es justo lo que está también buscando el proceso del Foro Generación e Igualdad, ¿no? que es un proceso multiactor, que tenemos juventudes, sociedad civil, gobiernos, sector privado, filantropía, agencias de la ONU, y este es nuestro momento para construir consenso. Entonces creo que para mí una palabra importante que traigo a la mesa es el, el término consenso, que es una práctica que justo se da mucho en nuestro movimiento también como mujeres indígenas, que privilegiamos el diálogo, la palabra, la conversación, y aunque eso a veces nos implique más tiempo, nos permite arribar a soluciones que incluyen esta diversidad de voces y que nos permiten esta continuidad de nuestro movimiento. ¿no? Eso, gracias. Thank you so, so much, Rivia. Thank you so much uh, again for bringing the word consensus to your table. I think it's really, really important. And of course, words accompanied by actions. Now I would like to ask Lina to answer the two questions, please. Maybe Lina's having maybe connection problems, so I would like to ask Mohamed to ask it, the two answer the two questions, please. I'll let you know when Lina joins. Hello, everyone. I'm extremely happy to be here. My name is Mohamed Ali Radewi. I'm a youth national gender activist with the Generation Equality Campaign. I'm a Gender Innovation Agora member and a founder of NEFAS. Uh, answering your question, I believe that co-creating, co-leading, and co-designing frameworks, agendas, and all the steps throughout the ideation phases and brainstorming uh, brought young change makers on board, gave us a seat on the table, and allowed us not only to participate, but to sustainably engage, transforming us from as youth, from partners to co-leaders uh, of the entire process. And if we observe the youth as an active uh, actor in the process, we will understand that we are basically two profoundly different groups. Millennials and Generation Z. Both generations were exposed to different contexts of technology, internet, and access to information. And bringing both of them on board is such an added value and a plus, which allowed an interesting diversity in the tools, thinking patterns, design thinking techniques, etc. From another side, in the GEF, uh, the GEF was intersectional and inclusive in a very uh, interesting way, allowing different groups of young leaders across the globe and from different cultural backgrounds to join and engage actively which allowed a huge diversity. We got uh, queer feminists, eco-feminists, intersectional feminists, BLM feminists, etc. cetera. Uh, I would love to share another personal story that I would love to uh, tell you about it, which is the fact that co-leading a lot of the steps uh, throughout the GEL with very interesting profiles and leaders inspired me profoundly and inspired me to found a new organization in Tunisia and in the MENA region fighting for gender equality and inclusivity. I believe that there is a lot of takeaways from this experience. However, uh, one thing to be remembered is that young people can lead, can be an added value, and will always demand inclusivity. Thank you so, so much, Mohamed. It was super interesting what you told about your personal experience, and of course, co-creating, co-leading, -co and of course, deciding. Um, I would like to ask Jandi. Hello, Jandi. It's really nice to see you again. To answer the two questions, please. Thank you so much, Lieta. Um, and thank you for your beautiful moderation and the opportunity to be on this beautiful panel. My name is Yande Banda and I'm the chair of Transform Education, a youth-led coalition that is hosted by the UN Girls Education Initiative, where we're actively transforming education for gender equality. To answer your question, youth networks and young activists have been critical to the COVID-19 response as we know it, in not just speaking about these issues, but by taking action on them too. Young people have been at the forefront of speaking up for the social challenges we face and how they've been been exacerbated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We refuse to be left behind the scenes in these important conversations and we're champions of our own issues and are leading movements in the digital and physical world today. One of the key issues that young people are leading on is the equitable and inclusive access to education and speaking of how education is a fundamental human right and not a privilege. Quality education for all is something that is, quality education for all is not only for those who can afford it. And so we're demanding for a socially gender transformative education system that focuses on how we can shift power dynamics and how we can ensure that young people's leadership potential is being fostered. And this is also in relation to the Generation Equality Forum and the Action Coalitions on Education. Secondly, I believe that young people in all their essence, in all their leadership, have the potential to lead all these big processes that we're looking at and that we're talking about. And demystifying the idea that leadership is only belonging to a certain group of people or a certain age group, but those who are willing to create accountable change. Some of the recommendations is to continue 
a hostilic intergenerational response to advance this work, and one that is rooted in intergenerational action beyond just intergenerational dialogue. We want to partner, we want to cooperate, and we want to mobilize, and we want to do it together. Above just speaking on panels, we must be thoroughly involved in, in, in instituting the actions of the action coalitions. Secondly, we must continue to challenge the patriarchal and misogynistic structures that silence girls and women and dehumanize boys and men. And we must take a well-rounded feminist approach in engagement within these structures. Lastly, we must continue to empower adolescent activists with resources, networking, and technology to enable them to drive actions crucial for transforming their communities and advancing gender equality. And in conclusion, we cannot go back to the old normal because normal was never safe. We must co-create a new normal rooted in challenging patriarchal systems to truly build back equal for the world. Thank you so, so much, Anne. It's always a pleasure to hear from, hear from you. It's always a privilege to hear from you. And of course, thank you so much for your recommendations. Now to end this wonderful panel, panel I would last, uh, like to ask Lina to answer the two questions, please. Yes, thank you. And sorry for joining you uh, uh, um, a little bit late. Uh, I'm the Beijing generation. I, I, I think the best formative time of my life was around preparing, going to Beijing, and then bringing Beijing with me uh, back home. But since then, I'm no longer uh, uh, part of the younger generation. And I think, and since then, what has happened? And let me allow me, Julieta, to just answer the two questions from the perspective of my region, the, the MENA region, which is a region that has a huge, what they call the, the huge youth uh, bulge. But at the same time, it's the place where uh, there are the least opportunities possible for young women, young LGBTQI groups, or uh, any woman and girl from any uh, but belonging to any vulnerable uh, community or, or, uh, or category. From this perspective, why is the Generation Equality for Forum uh, uh, important as, uh, as, a, as a convening? Um, a number of things. One, uh, for myself, I'm incredibly reassured that there's a, a, a generation of young uh, women and girls, young LGBTQI groups from my region who are part of the preparation, who are actually involved in shaping, in co-creating this, may, what I consider to be a major event. Secondly, um, despite all the conflicts, you know, um, um, one one may want to think that since 2011 we have been going to, you know, we've been transforming towards the better. Actually, not. We are the oppression in our region has increased, militarization has increased, uh, uh, religious fundamentalism has increased, militarization has increased, and at the forefront of all this, at the forefront of the revolutions that are currently taking place as we speak in Iraq, in Syria, in Sudan in Lebanon are actually the, the, the young people. And I want to just quote one thing which is so critical for us as we, uh, as the countdown has begun towards uh, uh, generation equality. Uh, Human Rights Watch spoke with, uh, with groups of, uh, from the queer community during the Lebanese revolution, which started last October, October 2019, and asked them, you know, what is it? What, how did you, um, what made you go down to the streets? Uh, weren't you afraid, etc.? cetera? And you, you, of course you know, and everybody knows about the oppression that, that, that exists, you know, and how, how dangerous it is for young people. And basically they said, well, we decided it is our revolution. It is ours. We're not participating in it, just it is ours. And, and I, I feel the same way about generation equality, about Jeff. It is theirs. It is for the groups who have been, you know, a long time uh, coming, kept out of the uh, of the negotiations table, kept out of peace talks whenever these peace, peace talks uh, take place, but are cons consistently oppressed and derived, you know, deprived from their basic, from their basic rights to freedom and to, to their own uh, 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 identity. So, so just to um, just to conclude, uh, uh, Julieta, three points. First of all, uh, th that that space for leadership, uh, for co-creation uh, in the, the runner-up to, uh, to generation equality, how do we preserve it after? How do we make sure that after Mexico, after Paris, that this is where the investment need, need, needs to go? I mean, 
now I have to say we're we're in the hype of the preparation for Je for for uh, for Jeff. We're excited. Things are happening. The conversations are happening. Never mind the pandemic. Never mind conflicts. Never mind economic uh, uh, downfalls. We are through. This is the excitement of that that period just before the event. What happens next? How do we invest? How do we make sure that this space is preserved, is sacrosanct after a GF? Secondly, and and more uh, um, um, and more importantly, and this is where you know I turn to uh, uh, feminist leaders in the world who make things happen. What? How do we support young people? And again, take into consideration that there is no such thing as a homogeneous youth group. You know, we, we, the, the youth with all its diversity. How do we make sure that actually um, there is enough support, solidarity to face oppressive regimes? Uh, I'm sorry, it's my mission. I'm not sorry, but I just want to clarify. It's I, I feel it my mission to come to bring it back to the to the MENA region because it's invisible and because so much injustice takes place in this in this region. So, what kind of support do young people need uh, uh, in this region, especially especially the queer community, especially migrant work, I mean, migrants, and especially dis displaced uh, uh, women and displaced youth? So that's 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 second. And then thirdly, um, what is the mechanism? I mean, I, I'm, I spoke first, my first point was about this continuing this space and nurturing this space that was created in the runner up for Jeff. But what is the space and the mechanism that we need to think about that we need to put in place where actually it's, there's an ongoing conversation, solidarity, exchange, action, uh, uh, um, uh, mobilization, not just vis-a-vis -vis Jeff. Jeff should not be, um, Jeff should not be a standalone uh, uh, moment or a standalone uh, event. How do we how do we connect it with CSW? How do we connect it with the CEDO uh, committee? How do we how do we uh, uh, bring together all these uh, all these synergies? And how do we make sure that this leadership? I guess that's my last point. This leadership that came together uh, to work for Jeff. That it's actually the leadership that uh, uh, that is maintained for post for the post Jeff period. Thank you, Julieta. Thank you so 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 much, Lena, for every every point you put on the table. Um, we have get got to get to the end of this panel. I would like to thank uh, thank all the panelists that um, participated in this conversation today. And I think that what I'm taking home today is after this crisis. After the Generation Equality Forum, we can't get back to normal. We have to change for better. We have to work for accountability. We want. We have to work for intersectionality. We have to work for the youth to be part for for we be change makers and be key protagonists in areas of development. So once again, I would like to say thank you so much, and I pass the mic to Sherwin again. Thanks very much, uh, Julieta. I believe we're going to play a video now. Let's go to that. We are proud to come together to welcome the Generation Equality Forum. Thank you to you and women. The governments of France and Mexico. I went to civil society youth organizations and adolescent girls around the world. Philanthropic partners and the private sector. With your leadership, we're working together to spark the urgent action needed to advance gender equality at this critical time. To achieve the SDGs and implement the 2030 agenda, gender inequality must be eliminated. Faster progress across all the SDGs requires it. Yet, the COVID-19 crisis is reinforcing gender-based discrimination and inequalities, creating a disproportionate negative impact on millions of women and girls. The gains made in recent decades are being rolled back. The Generation Equality Forum offers a critical opportunity to prevent the backsliding of progress. This forum can help to tackle the enduring inequalities that hold women and girls back. 
Together, by making bold commitments at this forum, we can make a difference in areas that include stopping gender-based violence. So that laws and policies are passed and implemented that can protect 550 million more women and girls worldwide. A global reset on care, work and equal pay. Through policies that will recognize, reduce and redistribute unpaid care work and create an additional 80 million decent care jobs putting women and girls at the heart of the new digital and green economies. By accelerating investment in gender responsive climate solutions. Halving the current global gender digital divide that will ensure that 600 million more women and girls can access the internet and it will help over 350 million more women and girls to gain access to a mobile phone. Empowering women and girls to make and act on their own decisions about their sexual and reproductive lives. Increasing resources for feminist, youth-led, and grassroots women's groups by doubling the annual growth rates of funding to such organizations. Being accountable to the rights of women and girls in conflict and humanitarian settings. As we start a drive for commitments to be announced at the Generation Equality Forum in June in Paris, we commit. We commit. We commit. We commit. We commit. It's, it's time, time to move from words to action. We call upon all organizations around the world to join us. We ask you to make ambitious and concrete commitments, commitments backed by resources. Join us and act for equal by making a commitment today. Great to hear from our UN principals. Uh, to quote them, it's time to move from words to action. We are, of course, running slightly ahead of time. So we have a little time to reflect on uh, that uh, panel led by Julia, Julieta Martinez. I just want to recap what some of the uh, main speakers said in that panel. Uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, the former president of the UN General Assembly, she talked about how generation, the, a Generation Equality Forum uh, provided an innovative platform for multilateral an action-oriented agenda. She said, "Feminist, a feminist green world requires investments in women's rights. Really a great intervention from her. Marta Delgado, the Undersecretary General for uh, Multilateral, the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights in Mexico, talked about the importance of the multi-stakeholder format, the intergeneral nature of the uh, Generation Equality Forum, uh, bringing together different actors, new actors, which is a key uh, to, to, to moving forward on this agenda. And Sophie Noor, she talked about how they want to see development projects driven by young people. She talked about the, the need to trust and invest in youth in order to change the status quo. Uh, we want youth to be part of the policymaking process. When you talk about young people, remember to include us. Let's make Mexico the momentum we need. Alvira Pablo, she talked about the indigenous question in this debate, right? The structural inequalities for indigenous people. She talked about the importance of consensus building, the importance of dialogue, the importance of using your words, right? Rather than your guns uh, to move the agenda forward. Mohammed Ali Radui talked about transforming youth to be co-leaders of the agenda, not just participants, but co-leaders. Young people can lead, they can be the added value and will always, they will always demand uh, inclusivity. Yanda Banda, very exciting presentation that she gave us. She talked about transforming education for gender equality. We refuse to be left behind the scenes. We want a transformative gender education system that challenges the patriarchal misogynist structure that perpetuates the status quo. We must co-create, she said. We must co-create a new normal. Lina Abu Habib, of course, closing out that discussion, talked about the Gender Equality Forum is about bringing in the oppressed to the conversation. How do we ensure that after Mexico and Paris, we ensure investment goes to the right parts of this agenda? So wonderful interventions from our speakers in that second panel. We now move to this third and final segment, 
We are moments away from the third and final panel, which I will tell you more about in just a moment. Uh, but to take us there, I want us to listen to someone very well versed in the issues we are grappling with in so many ways. She is a leading voice in the face of the gender equality movement. The executive director of UN Women will also talk about the Act for Equal uh, hashtag, a new campaign to invigorate awareness around gender equality. But before she comes on, let's watch this video. While we waited, a woman was locked down with her abuser. While we waited, a girl was forced out of school. While we waited, a mother fed her children, not herself. In the year the world stopped. Women's rights were reversed, undoing years of progress. Just like that. As the world begins to turn again, we must begin to act. For the one in three women who have experienced violence in their lifetime. For the 47 million more women being pushed into extreme poverty because of the pandemic. For the 50% of the population who deserve 50% of the power. This year, leaders and changemakers will meet at the Generation Equality Forum. A forum to build up and strengthen women's rights for generations to come. Let's show that we're standing up so equality can step forward. And in a year where it's virtually impossible to meet, we'll, we'll meet, meet virtually. virtually. Don't wait. It's time to act for equal. It's time to act for equal, uh, leading us to one of our keynote speakers today, the Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Pumzilem Lambong Muka. The floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Sherwin. Good morning uh, to all partners of Generation Equality. Thank you so much for this uh, inspiring start by young people. Thank you, Mexico, for giving us a teaser of what to expect in Mexico. I think uh, today, in all earnest, uh, the countdown to Mexico has started. And thank you, Sherwin, for your facilitation and all the other young facilitators who have been uh, managing the program thus far. The governments of Mexico and France have truly uh, stepped up to facilitate an accelerated journey to gender equality. The member states who have come on board in all their diversity and the ones that are co-hosting today, Canada, Malawi, and Netherlands, thank you for offering us this opportunity to civil society uh, in all its diversity with young people at the core. Thank you for having Stuart the journey and brought us thus far. The excitement about generation equality is something you can now feel and touch. And of course, to my colleague uh, in the UN family, thank you for your enthusiasm. The video that we just watched showed that uh, the, the United Nations is all in, in generation equality. So today it is a, a cat and razor we are beginning to look at the substantive and strategic dialogues uh, that will feature on the agenda in Mexico from the 29th to the 31st uh, of March. We are hoping to emerge there with concrete steps that we are going to be taking to close the gender gap. What is unique about generation uh, equality? Generation equality responds to the gaps that we identified when we evaluated the implementation of the Beijing platform. It also responds to the concerns we have about the slow progress in implementing the SDGs, but it also now responds to the challenges that have been brought about by the pandemic. While uh, Beijing was a moment where women 
brought to the table the context of uh, women's deprivation, women's denial of rights all over the world. They made it sure that member states and everyone understood that women's rights are human rights and then continued from then onwards to embark on a program of changing the laws so that gender equality is not seen as a nice to do or as just an ancillary development charity type activity, but it is about rights. And the last 25 years has been the development of, juris of jurisprudence, has been the development of jurisprudence uh, of gender equality, which has evolved to what it is today, such that you can have movements like Me Too taking off the way it did. But with all of that energy, with all of those member states that were in Beijing having come together, having stayed within uh, this collective that is taking forward uh, the Beijing Platform for Action, we have not achieved all that we hope to achieve. So we now feel it's time to change gears, to bring in a new constituency with energy to diversify the participants, as well as to stand firmly on the shoulders of those who have been carrying this task for the last 25 years. Generation equality is about creating activities that will act in a manner that supports the intergovernmental processes, such as those that are being discussed in a CSW, so that where they fall short, this will also complement them and make sure we move forward. It is a business plan for everyone because in generation equality, we want to be a coalition that includes and not excludes. So we are open with all the controversies that we will face and we must face them and try to make the relationships work that come with working with people who come from different spaces. We should stay focused on achieving what is important for women through this business plan. It is about generating resources and budgets that should support this plan, something that we did not manage to do in Beijing. So we are learning and improving our organizing tactics it is about naming the concrete deliverables, measurable deliverables within timeframes that we have agreed on. We have said generation equality will run from 2021 to 2026, where we will evaluate what have we done? How much have we moved toward in entrenching both the human rights culture, but also delivering concretely on the needs of women? And of course, the action that we choose in generation equality must be game changing, must be bold, because we cannot now do incremental change. It is noon time. It is the last effort we have to make change that is significant, but change that is systemic and change that will last. And as I conclude, because we are also in a pandemic, which has showed us how much inequality affects women. It has shown us through the increase of violence against women, the girls uh, dropping out of school, the digital divide that we have seen, the increase in the burden of care that is, uh, is being shouldered by women. All of those things are part of what we have to address also in generation equality. It is therefore not acceptable that 80% of task teams that are addressing COVID-19 challenges in different, 80% of the countries in, have, have task forces that are dealing with COVID-18 that are predominantly men. This cannot be. We have to reset and build back better by ensuring that women have got a strategic and a meaningful place on the table. Because if we lose the time to reset right now, it's gonna take a long time 
before we get an entry point again. So all hands on deck, let us go back and start with changing the way we deal with COVID-19 as part of changing how generation equality will deliver. Thank you. Executive Director, thank you as always for your input. You know, you had so many great sound bites that need to be repeated, and I'm just going to take two minutes to do that. Generation equality responds to the gaps left after Beijing. It responds to the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you've been watching and haven't been under a rock, you'll know that women and girls are disproportionately affected, whether you're talking about economic situations, health outcomes, uh, the rise in child marriage and pregnancies as a result of children being out of school, women and girls are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Gender equality, you say, is not about something nice to do. It is a question of rights. And when we talk about rights, we're also then talking about a question of justice. Time to change gears, says the executive director, bring in the new consist constituency, diversify participants uh, while standing on the shoulders of those who have come before us in the last 25 years since Beijing. It's now 26 years. Uh, this Generation Equality Forum provides us with a business plan for everyone. This is a co coalition that does not exclude, but it includes when we build back better, when we talk about building back better, let us ensure that women have a strategic place at the high table. Our Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Pumzile Mlambongluka, thank you so much for your input. Our final segment panel today will embrace a TED Talk style of engagement as we focus on the importance of women's leadership and strengthening feminist movements and the role of action coalitions in accelerating gender equality. We have a number of speakers who will be given two minutes each to be clear, that's 120 seconds. And they will be asked the, these two questions. Why are generation equality action coalitions important in accelerating gender equality? And why is strengthening women's leadership and feminist movements critical to galvanize gender equality in the great reset, in the great building back better uh, post COVID-19. My first uh, panelist is Karina Gould. She's the Minister of Development from Canada. Minister Gould, over to you. Thank you so much, Sherwin, and good morning from Canada. Today's, today's event has me feeling uplifted and energized for the work ahead. I want to thank UN Women, France and Mexico for their leadership in creating generation equality. And I'm really happy to be here and excited about what we can achieve through the Feminist Movements and Leadership Action Coalition. Canada's pleased to co-lead this coalition with Malawi and the Netherlands, along with a wide array of civil society organizations and philanthropic organizations. As we reimagine the world after the pandemic, what we have in front of us is an important opportunity to shift the balance of power toward feminist leadership. There has never been a better time to make sure that the responses we create to global issues are inclusive, intersectional, and represent several generations and types of stakeholders. And as we look toward the meeting in Mexico later this month, a global vision has been coalescing one where women not only lead in decision-making, but can and do participate in a meaningful way. This also means bringing adolescent girls and youth-led organizations into the process. When everyone is at the table, we can create real and lasting change. Thank you to all of the fantastic young speakers who have shared their vision for inclusive feminist leadership for a more equal and equitable future. And congratulations, Julieta, for such a great previous segment. If there's an opportunity, I would love to become an honorary tremenda. I am pleased to be working with other leaders of the Action Coalition to shape a model for sustainable intersectional feminist leadership that reflects inclusive values. Working closely with the women's organizations is one important way to do this. They are often at the front lines during crises, advocating for women's and girls' rights, shifting gender norms and breaking down barriers to gender equality. As you may know, in the past few years, Canada has been supporting women's rights organizations and movements. And this is a cornerstone of our feminist international assistance policy. And frankly, this support has paid off. For example, our work with the Women's Voice and Leadership Program, which works locally with Southern women's rights organizations to strengthen their capacity. In many countries, it has been a struggle for them to find funding and do the kind of advocacy work they need to do. And the Equality Fund is a first of its kind of global funding platform. 
It brings together granting, philanthropic, and investment actors to create a sustainable source of funding for women's organizations. This is a great example of what multi-stakeholder platforms can look like and what they can do for gender equality. I encourage others to get involved in the Generation Equality Forum and to make bold commitments to feminist leadership. That includes funding for feminist movements and women's organizations. Together, we can drive our commitment forward and accelerate progress toward gender equality and empowering women and girls everywhere. Thank you, Sherwin. Thank you, Minister Gould, and thank you so much as well for Canada's leadership on the gender equality agenda and for co-hosting today's event. Patricia Kaliati is the Minister of Gender, Social Welfare and Community Development from Malawi, also a co-host of today's event. And remember, the question, Minister, is why are generation equality action coalitions important in accelerating gender equality? And why is strengthening women's leadership and feminist movements critical to galvanizing gender equality in the Great Reset after COVID-19? The floor is yours. I think so much. Your Excellencies, Executive Directors and all my seniors, Indeed, it's a human right. Uh, the women's equal participation and also leadership in the political and public uh, life uh, that is essential for more inclusive uh, decision making and also creation of diverse solutions to the uh, various problems in our societies. As I'm, I'm speaking now, we are coming from the village where we are launching a number of programs to do with uh, uh, generation equality the, uh, for equality. And we have also the feminist movement, which we are looking forward to make women, the young women and men, very strong in their own uh, programs as they, as they implement government policies. We need to involve them. As a human rights, we have a number of programs which we've done as government, knowing that we have 38% of uh, women ministers, and we have also 23% of members of parliament women. But also we've done a lot. We have a speaker who is a woman. And uh, we salute the uh, generation equality, but also the for equality, which is really empowering the youth. And this is what we are looking forward to see. What is it that they want a nation of today? What is it that they want uh, that's from Mexico to also Paris? What is it that government is supposed to do? Then we cannot be responding on their issues if they're not even participating. We have a number of programs which we are doing in the pub public as well as uh, private institutions, universities, uh, the policies which have launched the national plan of action that the women and the young, uh, young women and also young men, they've got to be participating. We have uh, the registrations which we have, and we are still doing and having registrations. The gender equality, the persons in trafficking, we have the marriage, divorce and family relations. We have, uh, uh, looking forward to see a woman who is at 18, is supposed to be at a tertiary education than in marriage. We have the registrations which the, 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 our courts are implementing, the enforcers, the police, I implementing, make sure that the women and the girls are protected. As we are focusing very much on the young women, we also focus very much on the girls in the primary schools and where we are coming from. So that from the primary school to the tertiary education, they've got to understand what is it and who they are and what are the programs which they are looking for, for the future. And the respect which men are supposed to be giving to the girls and how the girls are supposed to protect themselves from the, from the perpetrators, issues to do with the early marriages. The end, the uh, the early pregnancies, the leadership programs in the in the in the youth. So we need to salute the UN and also I'm the co-leader of uh, the co-lead in the uh, uh, Canada uh, ministers, uh, Kalina and also the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm really proud of these feminist movements. We are having very strong ones here in Malawi. Women and young women and young, young leaders they are very much in front of all the policies and the programs which are using, as we are focusing very much to the vision 2030 of UN, as well as the vision 2063 of AU, and also the Malawi vision of 2063. We are, and we are going to lead, and we're going to communicate, and we're going to respect the young women, and we're going to follow their programs. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Minister Patricia Kaliati, literally joining us uh, on the move from the back of her uh, convoy, a car, and we really thank you for making time to uh, speak with us at this very, very important event, uh, the Minister of Gender, Social Welfare and Community Development from Malawi. It's my pleasure now to introduce Matu Joini. She is South Africa's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, uh, our ambassador uh, uh, serving the country of the Republic of South Africa at the UN. 
Why ambassador is generation equality and action coalitions important? And why is strengthening women's leadership and feminist movements critical to galvanizing gender equality in the great reset post COVID-19? Over to you. Ambassador, are you with us? I think that she is, but I don't know what is going on with the, her connection. Okay, while, while we while we wait on uh, the technicians to sort out uh, Ambassador Jeannie's uh, connection issues, let's move on to Delphine O. She is the Secretary General of the Generation Equality Forum in France. Madame O, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sherwin. Hello, greetings to everybody from Paris. Hello, Pumzile, and dear friends from the core group and all our uh, partners uh, uh, for the Generation Equality Forum. Sherwin, you asked two questions and I'm gonna to try to answer them within the minute and a half that is left. Why are uh, action coalitions important in accelerating gender equality? Well, the first reason that we haven't convened as international community for the past 25 years, it, it, outrageous, <laughs> I should say, in the past 26 years. So in order to accelerate this global plan for gender equality and women's rights, we needed the Generation Equality Forum, which is very much a platform for catalyzing actions. Looking at the past, what you know, what we have done, what we have achieved, what we have not achieved, but also more importantly, giving a new impulse, a new dynamic, a new momentum for uh, the next generation. And this is the real reason behind the name Generation Equality. The second reason is that we are undertaking something that has never done, been done before, which is bringing to the table a different variety of actors and stakeholders who have never been working together, who had been working in their own compartments before. Uh, by then, I mean member states, international organizations, obviously the UN, civil society, but also youth organizations, private sector foundations, and all stakeholders who are committed to gender equality. And this is quite unheard of, unusual, and in that sense, we mean to accelerate gender equality by bringing all the stakeholders to the table and making them work together towards the roadmaps of the Action Coalition. And then why is leadership important, leadership of women? It's a question, obviously, of empowerment, uh, but it's also a question of rights. And if you may recall, Hillary Clinton 25 years ago famously said, uh, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. I think it's time to reclaim this claim, to restate it to the face of the world, to own it as ours collectively, and also to recall that women's rights are human rights and universal rights. They are not to be uh, differentiated you know, between regions, between religions, between cultures. They are universal. France is the champion of the Action Coalition on sexual and reproductive rights, uh, the right to contraception, the right to abortion. All of these rights are universal rights. Wherever you are, how, you know, whatever is your ethnicity, your color of skin, uh, your age, your religion, your culture, those are universal rights that we intend to claim as a generation equality in Mexico at the end of this month and then in Paris, where we all uh, look forward to greeting you virtually. Thank you very much to Delphine O, the Secretary General of the Gender Equality Forum in France. And we all remember that uh, pink suit that Hillary Clinton wore at the Beijing uh, uh, conference when she made that famous statement. And we heard from Kamala Harris at uh, CSW earlier this week, which I think she took that discussion further, right? W women's rights are human rights, human rights are, 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 are women's rights. Uh, Kamala Harris talking about how women's rights are about democracy. And when we take care of women's rights, we then solidify and uh, the foundations of democracy, democracy in our societies. Thank you so much for that intervention. Do we have Marty Juini on, on the line? Are you with us, Ambassador? Okay. We are we bringing her into the um, um, panel, so bear with okay, us for so a moment. We, 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 we'll get to the ambassador from South Africa in a little bit. Uh, Licia Redeliki is a cabinet member of the Commission for Equality at the European Commission, answering the same questions. Over to you. Thank you and hello from Brussels, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Commissioner Daly, responsible uh, for equality at the European Commission, I would like to underline the key role of women's organization and feminist movements in particular during the pandemic. You helped us keeping a finger on the pulse regarding alarming increased domestic violence cases. You provided victims with information about available support, including such as uh, sexual and reproductive health rights in times of lockdown, when women were cut off from helplines, medical and psychological support, or even shelter places. And it is in this respect that the commission swiftly refocused 
the EU UN Spotlight Initiative funding to address violence against women and girls in the context of COVID-19 response. I also would like to reiterate the work you women's organizations do in the fighting misinformation and ongoing backlash against women's rights. Together, we must develop concrete actions and strong leadership to help women on the ground. Before the pandemic, young women climate activists around the world led the Fridays for Future marches. We must continue supporting them. The Generation Equality Forum creates this opportunity to support women's and girls' voices, decisions, and action, actions sorry, in building a gender equal future and an inclusive leadership. I thank the civil society organizations and movements, re relentless work, engagement and input in turning this crisis into an opportunity to advance gender equality and achieve a world where women and girls in all their diversity can lead, thrive and be free. I also thank you and women, Mexico and France for making Generation Equality Forum happening. Lisa Radlecki, a cabinet member of the Commission of Equality at the European Commission, thank you for your intervention. Stephanie Ortaleva is the founding president and legal director at Women Enabled International. You now have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm muted. Hello, good morning to everyone or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I wish you. Uh, wonderful beginnings to the continuation of the Beijing platform. Um, just to give a, a history lesson from some 26 years ago, in Beijing, uh, there was a very large delegation of disabled women, feminist disabled women, and who contributed to the formulation of the original Beijing platform for action. However, the COVID pandemic has shown us that while that was a very important beginning, it was only a beginning, and there's much that needs to be done to ensure the rights of disabled women um, because the pandemic has exposed some of the significant inequalities as it relates to sexual and reproductive health and rights, and also to the increases in uh, the extreme significant experience of gender-based violence of disabled women and girls. We, um, the, the action coalitions are very important because they're both bringing together uh, all the important actors to make this sort of change. However, one of the challenges has been that um, various groups of women and girls have not been included within the discussions historically or historically as much as we need to be included. This would include not only disabled women, but of course, rural and urban women, young feminist women, as we've heard from today, uh, indigenous women, uh, trans feminists, etc. All of these groups need to be included and we need to have a seat at a table and that table needs to be accessible to all women, both in terms of physical accessibility, but also inclusive accessibility. What is our objective? Our objective is to ensure a truly intersectional approach, looking at the multiple and intersecting dimensions of women's lives. Women may not only be a disabled woman, but she may be a rural woman. She may be a urban woman. She may be uh, an LBGTI woman. We need to consider all of these intersecting dimensions. And that's why the whole platform um, and this whole process is extremely important because through action coalitions, we seek to bring all of the voices together. So what is our objective? Where do we need to go? We need to ensure that all of these processes, both in terms of what's done at the United Nations, but also what's done in governments, non-governmental organizations, business, and all sectors of our society need to be intersectional 
and inclusive and not only work and act for equality, but also act for human rights. There can be no equality without the consideration and the inclusion of all human rights for all women. So we call upon all of the actors in the generation equality forum process to be intersectional, to have human rights at the forefront and to work hard for sustainable change. We not only, as we have said here in the United States, build back better, but we need to build back for equality. We need to build back for human rights. And most of all, we need to build back for intersectional inclusion. And just as a final note, we must also remember that women with disabilities are women too. And I thank everyone. And I look forward to virtually seeing you in Mexico City and in Paris. Thanks. Stephanie Orteleva is the founding president and legal director at Women Enabled International, talking about the importance of inclusive accessibility and the need to consider all the intersecting dimensions of the women's movement. We'd have to act for human rights. There is no equality without the inclusion of all human rights for all women. I am now told that Matu Joini, South Africa's permanent representative to the United Nations, has now been able to connect. Uh, Ambassador, warm welcome. We're asking a question. Why are generation equality action coalitions important in accelerating gender equality? And the second question, uh, why is strengthening women's leadership and feminist movements critical to galvanizing gender equality in the Great Reset? When we talk about building back better after COVID-19, your responses. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sherwin. No, I've been here. Uh, there was just a technical problem. So just to assure you that I've heard and I've really enjoyed participating and listening to, to, to the deliberations. But let me start by thanking and expressing my appreciation to the organizers of the side event, the UN Women, the governments of Canada, Malawi, and the ne Netherlands, and thank them for inviting us to be part of this dialogue. Uh, but also allow me to con commend the UN women for the excellent organization of CSW65. I know that's one part, but as the ED herself mentioned to us, this is in support of CSW. So I want to commend them for the work that they're doing in, in CSW65. Um, and, and just to say that we've heard the message that, that, that she said, that we need to be bold and suggest strong moves to propel us towards a, a, a gender equality and discrimination against women and girls and empower all of us. Um, and I need at this point to convey the message that South Africa fully supports a generation equality and what it stands for and what it brings to the table. Coming to the question that, that, that you are asking, why are action coalitions important in accelerating gender, gender equality? Um, three things that I want to, 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 to put forward. One, I believe that they bring on to the, and this is by the way, based on the experience of South Africa and how I've seen that work and play itself out in South Africa. Firstly, it brings political leadership onto the table. Uh, I've seen our president come out and say, Here's the two areas where we are responsible for the action coalitions that we are responsible for, our president and saying what they are. And then you find, so you have political leadership, political will, and all of us rally behind that, the ministers and, and, and government and civil society. So it brings folk, so political will. Secondly, it brings focus, it brings focus. So you know that these are the two areas that as a country we'll be focusing on. So it allows you to immediately shift into that gear that the ED was talking about and thinking creatively, thinking boldly about what needs to happen. But similarly, as you do that, uh, in this action coalition, you are able to share that experience with, with, with the rest of partners and others that are in generation equality. Lastly, um, they bring partnerships onto the table. And, and again, in South Africa, one thing that we, we, we have a history of uh, collaborating, of co-creating, of co-designing with civil society. And we've seen it again with, gen with, with the action coalitions that we are talking about. Women in South Africa, in rural areas, from townships and everywhere else, 
together to, to co-design the necessary interventions that we now have today from the private sector that we now have today in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your intervention. And I love the fact that you talked about the issue of political will. That, of course, uh, is cross-cutting when we talk about what it is we want to achieve uh, in terms of the developmental agenda, gender equality, women's empowerment. And I'll use, give you one example where intent matters, where political will matters. The USA had uh, less than 17% of ministerial positions held by women under the Trump administration. You had the Biden administration that came in and suddenly that number went up to 46%. That's intent. That's political political world. So there are decisions that can be made to address the inequities uh, on, in a very simple uh, action. And that's, and that's uh, I believe, called a political world. Thank you, Ambassador Martijuini, for raising that and for your intervention. Suba Wujeri, uh, Wujeri Wardena is an activist, researcher and writer at CREA, a global feminist human rights organization. Suba Wujeri si, Wujer, Siri Wardena, my apologies. Wow, teach me. Teach me how to say it right. That's okay. Thank you, Sherwin. It's Vijay Sirivardana. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, it's a, a really a great pleasure to be here with all of you, with um, so many, uh, you know, committed state representatives, civil society, young uh, folks, activists, young feminists. Uh, and I think it's it's a particular privilege and pleasure to speak um, uh, alongside and after Stephanie. Um, who is, you know, of course, a, a sort of a formidable feminist leader herself and one that we all look up to and, and learn uh, every day from. Um, CREA is a Global South uh, feminist-led uh, global human rights organization, and we are really privileged to have been selected as a civil society leader on the Action Coalition for Feminist Movements and Leadership. And uh, because Stephanie did such a great job talking about the sort of importance of inclusion and intersectionality, I thought I'd uh, spend the couple of minutes that I have to tell you a little bit more about the importance of civil society inclusion in this process and what you know we as civil society have been advocating for what we've been working on within the action coalition process. Um, so civil society in, in the action coalition for feminist movements and leadership has been actively advocating for first and foremost a strong foundational basis of feminist politics and thinking on which to ground our priority actions and everything that comes next. Um, fundamental to our work has, of course, like Stephanie said, uh, been an intersectional feminist lens. Um, and, uh, you know, this has not just meant ensuring commitment to inclusion and diversity, but ensuring a feminist power analysis within the action coalitions and ensuring that this power analysis doesn't rely on binary formulations such as men and women, global south, global north, young, old, etc. And that we are more rigorous in how we analyze power acknowledging inequalities at the geopolitical level, but also within regions, countries, communities, and of course, movements. We have been attempting to practice feminist leadership in critical ways which shifts and shares power, both within the action coalition, while also trying our best to embed those principles in our action statements. We have advocated tirelessly for accessibility and inclusion from the start ensuring that we try to abide by some guidelines which make the Action Coalition spaces more equitable for folks with disabilities, indigenous women leaders and others. Of course, the Action Coalitions have not entirely brought a feminist vision of inclusion to fruition. We are still missing so many voices in this space. We are missing the voices of trans and intersex folks, of sex workers, and, and we have to acknowledge and name that and work to correct it in the forums to come. We have coordinated across the action coalitions to build collective power, to bring strong consensus to some key issues which civil society feel that we are facing across the action coalitions. For example, we have collectively advocated, like I said, for inclusion and accessibility, for more involvement of civil society at every level. And we have discussed a shared desire to produce a concrete accountability framework for all stakeholders involved in the action coalitions. For you and women, for ourselves, for states, and especially for the private sector leaders. We have demanded that the action coalitions be spaces for co-creation and co-leadership, and we'll continue doing our part in ensuring this to the best of our ability. And civil society participation is essential in this regard because we bring the experience from movements on building relationships of trust and solidarity and in building collective resilience and power. Thank you so much. And we are very excited to see you all again in Mexico.
Suba Wajaseri Wardena, thank you so much for your intervention. We do appreciate it, and I apologize for that introduction. Our final speaker today, Yasmin Hassan, is a global executive director of the Equality Now. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to be part of this forum and to support the Generation Equality Forum. I'm going to talk a little bit about just my um, experience with the feminist movement, right? So I was about 10 years old when I saw Pakistani women take to the streets to protest laws that effectively made us second class citizens. They were tear gassed, they were beaten, and they were imprisoned, but they did not back down. And over and over again, I have witnessed women come together to protest injustice and to demand equality and fairness. There have been many, many brave survivors of gender-based violence uh, who, have, who have used their life and dedicated their life for change for others. Among them are Brisa Diangulo from Bolivia. She is a survivor of incest and rape and basically has led the movement against child sexual abuse and addressing deficiencies in rape laws, not just in Bolivia, but across the Latin America region. Also, Jaha Dupre from the Gambia, who was ready to take her own life when she was subjected to FGM and child marriage, but instead led a youth movement culminating in outlawing FGM in the Gambia. Now, the success of Beijing was really about the coming together of activists such as these and grassroots groups as well as women's rights organizations uh, at the global and regional levels. And we all demanded change from world leaders. And I do believe that tremendous progress has been made from the time of Beijing through individual and collective actions, particularly in terms of laws, policies, and frameworks. Where less progress has been made is in the implementation of these laws for the benefit of women on the ground. And this is where we must focus now. You know, vibrant women's rights organizations and activists are critical to identifying emerging, uh, emerging issues, monitoring implementation of existing commitments, as well as stemming the backtracking on women's rights that we see going on today. These women's rights movement needs support and resourcing, particularly in the aftermath of COVID. And we have heard how much uh, progress has been erased in girls' education, in women's employment, and how much violence against women has, particularly in the home, has increased exponentially in this time. So Generation Equality Forum really helps us take our agendas forward now, including critically by bringing new stakeholders to support feminist movements. I really look forward to the conversations, to the strategizing, and in particular, the actions that will help us not just build back better, but build back equal. That is our goal. Thank you very much. Yasmin Hassan, a global executive director of Equality Now, talking uh, about the importance of how we move forward and the conversations that lie ahead of us, both in Mexico and in Paris, concluding our uh, panel discussion. And before we wrap, let's watch this video. Progress for gender equality is under pressure. Without action, we risk regressing on the important gains made since the landmark Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. The COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating the situation, threatening the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. But together, we have the power to change this. It will take a dedicated, bold effort that builds on our breakthroughs, learns from our shortcomings, and engages new and diverse audiences of all ages. This is the vision of the Generation Equality Action Coalitions. Action Coalition leaders from member states, civil society, youth-led organisations, private companies, philanthropies and international organisations have been working together on an implementation plan to accelerate action for gender equality. And now is the time for you to join this effort. Each Action Coalition will put forward a set of concrete, ambitious and immediate actions to accelerate progress towards gender equality in the next five years. The themes cover gender-based violence, economic justice and rights, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, feminist action for climate justice, technology and innovation for gender equality, and feminist movements and leadership. In addition, a compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action will work to drive action and resources towards women and girls in conflict and crisis settings. 
So how can you engage with the Action Coalitions? By making a commitment. Women's and feminist organisations, youth-led organisations and other civil society actors, governments, philanthropies, international organisations and private sector companies are invited to join the Action Coalitions as commitment makers. Commitment makers will support the finalisation of the Action Coalition blueprints, make bold and transformative commitments to one or several Action Coalitions, play a catalytic role in supporting the implementation and monitoring of blueprint actions, and mobilise other stakeholders around the Action Coalition theme and blueprint. This implementation will be reviewed on an annual basis. Now is the time to act for equal and to make gender equality a reality. Building back green, equitable, gender responsive and inclusive societies is possible. Generation Equality and its action coalitions are ready to be part of the transformation to a bold and gender equal future. With our collective power and commitment, we can make this happen. We can and we must make this happen. And that really is our show for today. Our thanks to the UN system principals who came to show their support for generation, uh, the Generation Equality Forum. Thanks to the Executive Director of UN Women, my co-moderators, Pip and Julieta, our awesome panelists and speakers and everyone who joined this event from around the world. A reminder that our hashtag for today and moving forward is act for equal Let's keep using it. Let's keep talking to it and networking with it. See you in Mexico in 10 days from everybody who worked so diligently on putting this event together. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>